You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, good morning. My name is Phil. If you're a guest here at Foundry, uh, welcome. Glad you're here this morning. So first question, have you ever had one of those no one will believe me type moments? That moment where like if you were to share the story, people would be like calling your bluff. I, uh, I heard a story that made me think about that. It was a, a Reddit thread and the Reddit user was describing a story that happened in Times Square down in Manhattan. And he had just gone into that double-decker McDonald's in Times Square, and he'd gotten, uh, he'd gotten the fries, the go-to, you got to get the fries, and he got a milkshake. And he's leaving the McDonald's, and he's in that crowded area of Times Square, and he sees this hand come out from around him and steal two French fries, right? Like, how dare you steal two fries? And he swivels and turns around, and it's none other than Bill Murray. And Bill Murray eats his French fries, and then as he's running off, is yelling, no one will ever believe you. <laughs> and it's such a great imagery, because if, if you know anything about like the exploits of Bill Murray, like it makes perfect sense. But I was imagining that Reddit user telling the story like, yeah, Bill Murray stole two of my fries. You're like, what? Like, Bill Murray didn't steal your fries. Yeah, he did. Like, Bill Murray stole my fries. And in this weird parallel, I almost think that today, that whole idea of, is this something that no one will ever believe? I think that's almost what Luke is trying to get across when he's telling the Christmas story. Now, Foundry, can we be honest? I think our tendency is to show up and it's like, oh, ho-hum, it's the Christmas story. It's what we do in church this time every year. And so I'm hoping that we can approach this with a fresh uh, lens in which to process this. Because I think in Luke's account, see, Luke is, Luke is the narrative descriptive writer. He's giving us the most details. He's using that medical background to really try and say, look, this may seem too good to be true, but I'm going to try and flush out the miraculous and the factual, right? Like no easy task. I'm going to try and give you something compelling, something captivating, something amazing, and I'm going to do my best to give it to you as it really happened. And I almost feel like Luke is saying, buckle up, like, would you believe me? Would you believe me if I told you that the Christmas story was ushered in first by angelic beings? Would you believe me if, if 2,000 years ago I told you that those hushed angelic whispers began to increase and the chatter picked up in the heavenly realms, right? Would you believe me if I told you that God used all parts of the created order to speak the good news? Because if we're honest, it really kind of can seem too good to be true, right? So the question then is, are we going to go Bill Murray and yell out, no one will ever believe you when Luke tries to give us this version of the Christmas story? Or will we stop and we lean in and we approach it, maybe with a fresh set of eyes and a new set of ears to hear this truth? So Luke begins his Christmas narrative like this. If you're following along in your scripture, we're going to be in Luke 1, verses 1 through 25. Follow along with me, it'll be up on the screen too. So here's Luke, the uh, trained physician in his descriptive writing, and you can almost hear his compelling voice saying, listen, as I try to give you the miraculous mixed with the factual. He starts out by saying this, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, something amazing, right? They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you can be certain, hang on to that, to be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order on duty that week. As the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Do you see the, 
the details, the specifics. I can tell you exactly where the angel stood. He was just to the right. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John, foreshadowing John the Baptist. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zacharias said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. And how many wives have prayed that prayer as well for their husbands? <laughs> for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. It's a crazy story, right? I mean, if you're Zechariah, this story is crazy. Because you've just encountered an angel, and to try and prove it, you've had to play 42 weeks worth of charades. You've had to try and describe this angelic encounter, and you can't speak. And so you're like, you know, doing the wings and coming from, and then people are like, uh, um, winged Pegasus. You saw a winged Pegasus in the temple, and he's frustrated, and he's trying to articulate what's happening. And I feel like if you're Zachariah, aren't you just back there in just this desperate moment, just be like, no one's going to believe me. Even if I could speak, they wouldn't believe me, right? This is how the Christmas story begins. But I think there's something that stands out to me, something that jumps out to me, and I don't know if it jumped out to you as well. Because Luke doesn't make this just about John the Baptist, and he doesn't make it just about the angel Gabriel. And those would have been two great focal points. But what, what does this all hinge on? What does it turn on? What's, the, what's really going on here? See, Luke, in all of his great descriptive writing, lets Gabriel's words give away the actual point. It's the whole theme, the whole theme of this next series. It's good news. It was in verse 19. I think everything hinges upon this one verse. Then angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. As we talked about it, we're like, this isn't just about angels, right? There's something bigger going on. There's this narrative thread, this whole idea of good news, the gospel. Let's learn a little Greek here this morning, Foundry. What he's actually saying, that word is euangelion. I've been sent to bring you this euangelion. Roughly translated, it means to announce the gospel or to proclaim the good news or to speak of the coming kingdom of Christ. It's that same gospel thread that you find woven throughout every page of scripture. Everything is pointing, everything is foreshadowing to Christ. Everything is about the gospel. And even in the Greek, when you translate it, you see the role that the angels have, right? You, meaning good. Angel, meaning to announce Euangelion, you see the word angel hidden right there in the middle of the word. And so we see God using every aspect of the created order to announce the gospel or the good news. However, what was the response? If we find ourselves in the story of Zechariah, what was his response to the good news? Because it certainly didn't jump out to him immediately as being good news. We see two dominant emotions going on with this euangelion. And I think there's two very important truths that I think we need to kind of wrestle with in our time here this morning. So how do we respond to the good news? How do we respond like Zechariah? Because the two dominant emotions, 
as I can see, are doubt and fear, right? Doubting what the angel said and fearing that the angel was there in the first place. How do we respond to this euangelion, to this good news? Well, let's focus first on doubt and then we'll circle back around to fear. So what was Zachariah's rebuttal to the angel? Right, he's just had this experience, right? He's just seen an angel. We know the location just to the right of the altar. And it says this, that there's euangelion in the doubt, that there is good news in the doubt going on. But what do I mean by good news in it? Well, again, look at his response. Zacharias had this encounter with the angel. And he says, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. I'm sorry, your first response when, when an angel of the living God shows up next to you is to question it? And you're like, that seems a little uh, counterintuitive, doesn't it? Like, God, God's messenger is right next to you, and you still don't trust the plan, right? He's told you verbatim what the plan is. And you're still like, yeah, I don't think you're right. Seems a little counterintuitive, but if we step into the story, I think we get it. I think we find ourselves in this. Because how many times through the scripture narrative did we see character after character question what God was doing with their life, right? Moses is like, how can you use me? Everybody's had this moment where you're like, uh, really, God, you want to use me? You've had it too, right? You've had that moment where you're like, man, I don't think you know my story. I don't think you know the background. I don't think you know my limitations or my weaknesses. God can't use me. And so I think we find ourselves like Zachariah walking in his shoes very quickly going, yeah, thanks for the plan, but I don't think it's going to work. And so I think we're in good company. And I see Zachariah filled with doubt and skepticism that God's actually going to step into this equation, right? And especially with an angel right next to him, he's still doubting, and it seems incredible. But let me at least come clean. I heard, a, I was listening to a podcast, and... and this guy apparently is a fairly well-known evangelist down in Latin America, and he was traveling around doing a revival service. And apparently the guy can see angels, and you'll have to forgive my, my skepticism. Because I'm listening to it, right? And I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, the guy can see angels. And he's describing this experience, and he's like, we saw the angel sitting on top of the church where the outreach was going to happen that night. And I'm like, you got an iPhone? Why didn't you take a picture? Like, like come on, I need more proof, you know? Like... That's kind of how I'm wired. I, okay, so you saw it, but I was like, I drove home and I'm still like wrestling with that. And I actually stopped and I was like, I stopped the truck and I was like, why, why is my first move to not believe the guy, right? Maybe I have trust issues. I was talking about it with my wife and I was like, I either maybe don't have enough faith and trust in what God is doing in the supernatural or I don't trust God's people. And I think it's leaning towards that. But I'm like, why is it that my first doubt is pessimism, skepticism, and doubt that this guy really saw an angel? Because like I said, I'd love to tell you that I was fully on board. And I'm here to tell you, I still believe in angels. I still believe in miracles among us. I still believe in God's Holy Spirit working in the unseen spiritual realms. I believe in all of that. But my first inclination is doubt. And I'm still not sure why, but I, I think it has something to do with being a product of a system. Let me explain that. Our Western educational model, right? How are we taught to process the world? We're taught to only process and engage with what we can know for certain, the material world, right? There's this natural tendency for us to divide the material from the spiritual and to say, we're only gonna focus on the material. In other words, we have a predisposed bias to lean into only what we can touch taste, see, measure, and observe. And that works great for science class, but it's horrible for theology. And I think if this, the Christmas story played itself out today, I think you and I could easily be Zacharias, right? If, if you left Foundry today and you're like, I think I saw an angel, right? What's your next move? Tomorrow morning, are you over at the hospital getting a cranial CT scan? Are you, are you questioning whether you were hallucinating? Are you doubting that whole experience? Are you wondering just how expired was the Russ's mushroom soup that had been in the fridge for the last two weeks? And you're like, maybe it was the soup. I knew I shouldn't have heated it up, right? You'd be doubting it. If you go to work tomorrow and a coworker is describing talking to an angel, are you not maybe deep down rolling your eyes, right? 
If a virgin tells you she's with child impregnated by the Holy Spirit, how many of you are calling for a counselor, a lie detector kit, and some psychotherapy? Right? If the story plays itself out, I think a lot of you are similar maybe to me where you're like, I'm not so sure. I'm not convinced. I can't just jump right into that. And you see our biases at work. You see how being a product of that educational system has called us to question every time there's something supernatural. I think our first inclination is towards doubt. But this is where the rubber meets the road. We live our lives expecting God not to show up anymore in the supernatural. Let me explain what I mean by that. I'm afraid, my fear, my hunch is, Foundry, that we have zero expectation of the miraculous actually happening or angels stepping into the fray because that's how we've been trained to think and act. Here's the reality. We expect God to work in the interior, right? God, change my heart. God, give me more compassion. God, give me more patience. God, bless my marriage. Be with my kids. Help my finances. We pray all these things, expecting God to work on the interior of our lives, but we pay lip service to the miraculous, don't we? And yet page after page after page of scripture is filled with God showing up in the miraculous. And I didn't drive here today thinking I would see an angel. I didn't drive here today thinking there would be the miraculous. It really wasn't part of the equation. I'm preaching on angels. I had zero expectation of an angel being up on the roof today. And I don't know how God chooses to reveal himself in that fashion. But what I do know is I think there's that natural tendency just to go, it probably won't happen. Right? We pay lip service to it. There was an article written in the Christian Century, and its title was Convicting Enough. It was called Embarrassed by God's Presence. And the authors were very blunt on their indictment of mainline Protestant churches in America. The article actually said this, the problem for our church, its theology and its ethics, is that it's simply atheistic. Ouch. The article went on to explain that how so much of what we do as the church is done as if God was not here. Do you see what we've done? What the authors are saying is we've become like practicing Christian atheists. We believe in the Christmas story. We believe in angels. We believe in the virgin birth but we've relegated it to something that can only happen in the past. It's not a now thing, it was a that happened back then thing. Do you get that sense? Because I get that sense too where I go, of course God did that back then. That's what God did back then. What about now? What about this Christmas season? Is there any room for the miraculous still to happen? Right? I don't want to be a practicing Christian atheist that only believes that that was past tense. You know, because we have no problem singing angels we have heard on high, but the problem is that that's not something we believe will still be happening today when we leave this place. So, is it an ever-present possibility in your life? Did you walk in here today thinking that there was a chance that God might actually show up? Not just on the interior. But see, God's not just moving in the past. If God wasn't here, all of this is silly. All of this is ridiculous if his presence isn't here. Do you know what I mean? All of the singing, if he's not here with us, is in vain. And we believe he's here. We believe his presence is here. So why is it that we're so hesitant to actually believe that something miraculous might happen this Advent season? Now, like I said, there is good news in this. So where's the good news in the doubt, right? Like, I don't see a lot of good news in your skepticism, Phil. Well, here's the thing. There's an invitation that's still going on. The invitation is this. When Christ, when his disciples were like, hey, Jesus, why are you teaching in all of these parables? Why don't you just say it? Why don't you just come out and speak more candidly or, or be a little more blunt? He's like, the reason I'm using these parables is because I want you to have eyes to see and ears to hear, right? Eyes to see what? Ears to hear what? the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the mysteries of the good news, the euangelion, the mysteries of the gospel, right? There is an invitation and that invitation is still open. And so if you're skeptical like I am, if you're pessimistic like I am, the invitation is to put on your Christmas list this year, new ears and new eyes. And again, I don't know how God's gonna choose to reveal those supernatural revelations of himself. I don't control the time and the place, but I wanna be open to it. Do you know what I mean? I want to walk in here with an expectant heart that says, God may yet just show up and blow my mind. 
I want to drive home and know that I could probably see an angel if God would give me the eyes and the ears to do so. Oddly enough, after the first service, there was angel stories floating around and I was getting the goosebumps again. It was, it was cool. Share those stories. I don't think, I know God's not, I know God is still at work. I'd love, I wish we had time just to pass the microphone and you could share those stories where you're like, Phil, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure that wasn't an angel. One of the stories this morning was like, yeah, angel, Garfield Ave, Zealand, awesome. Awesome, right? It's not just in the past. And the invitation is still open. Christ actually says, blessed are the ones with eyes to see and ears to hear and foundry. May that be true of us, a church that longs to see what God is doing behind the veil, a church that longs to hear what God is up to. When the gentleman approached me, he just said, have you ever heard the voice of an angel? And I shook my head and I'm like, I'm super jealous though. Wish I had. Now, beyond the doubt, there is good news. The invitation is still open. But there's also another dimension going on here. It's not just Zechariah doubted the angel, but he was also afraid. So let's look at fear as we close up this morning. I believe that there is euangelion, there is gospel, there is good news in the terror, in the fear. Let's go again and flash back. What is it that Zechariah said? While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed. You could almost translate that as terrorized when he saw the angel. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. And so why is it, Foundry, that every time an angel makes an appearance on the scene, why is it that usually the first words out of the angel's mouth is, don't be afraid? Why are we so afraid, right? Because again, if you just looked... At the biblical accounts, there's always this fearful emotion that the angel provokes. And yet our artwork, they always look like, like militant and Gaddis babies, like, like they've been eating too many cookies and pies and they might shoot you with their little arrow. There's nothing about that imagery that would ever provoke fear. And so maybe we need to finally get past the cherub and maybe embrace them as they were, God's messengers, God's commandos, something to be afraid of. But listen, this isn't just like, I'm afraid of this because this is uncanny, like this is weird, this is something I've never seen before. I think there's a different fear going on. And so when the angel says, fear not, I think there's something bigger at play, right? Eric was talking with the water series about hearing those echoes through scripture, right? And I think this is one of those echoes back to Genesis chapter three, back to the fall. Because Adam and Eve, when they first turned from God, what was their initial response? They were afraid of God. You hear that echo. See, we were designed, Foundry, to be in perfect unity with God. We were designed to be in perfect relationship with no fear. If you're in perfect relationship with God, you have no reason to fear anything at all. But yet we chose, as they chose, to throw off God's rule, to say, I'm calling the shots now. I'm at the helm and for me to be happy, we've bought in the lie every generation since, right? We believe the lie that for you to be happy, for me to be happy, that we have to be what? Sovereign. That we have to be in charge. That we have to be at the helm. And the enemy promised that we wouldn't be truly happy until we were the ones calling the shots. And that distorted lie, like I said, has been just passed on from generation to generation. And it is indeed a lie, Foundry Church, because try as we may, we never seem to get control, Right? especially around the Christmas season. You're probably already here and you're overwhelmed. You're like, Christmas parties, baked goods, gifts, Christmas lists, relatives. It's stressful. We want to be in control of everything and it can seem, over I mean, just the Christmas experience alone can seem so overwhelming to so many. And our little control freak hearts are always trying to grab that throne and, and, and that crown and put it back on and say, I will call the shots, right? And so when the divine steps in, when God Almighty steps in, of course we feel afraid because we know right from the get-go that this God is holy and we are not. But we feel threatened when he calls out our sovereignty. We feel threatened when he asks for his rightful place on the throne. And our response is terror and fear. And the angel is literally saying, do not be fearing. 
If you really comprehend the gospel message, if you catch nothing else, Foundry, catch this. The good news is that a savior has been given to you, a king for the control for you inside all of us. And that fear that has dominated your life can finally be removed. It's bigger than just don't be afraid of the weird, right? Seeing an angel is weird, but it's so much bigger than that. It's don't being afraid of a holy God who wants to restore you to perfect relationship. It's what we sing every Christmas, God and sinners reconciled. The angel Gabriel is trying to convince Zechariah of the same thing. You don't have to be in terror. There is something about to happen and you might not even believe it. It might seem too good to be true that this God wants to actually be in relationship with us. This God wants to restore you back into perfect love. And it's going to happen and no one might believe you, but we're going to share the story anyway. I mean, that's, that's the miraculous in the Advent season. I want to close with this angel story. And like I said, I'm hesitant to share angel stories because of my own predisposed nature to doubt and skepticism. But there are multiple eyewitnesses, so I'm just going to lay it out there. A young girl named Dawa, back in 1956, she was living with her tribe in the remote jungles of Ecuador. And it just so happened that there was five young American missionaries trying to reach Dawa and her tribe, the Waodani, with the good news, with the Galeon, with the gospel. And they had been studying and learning the language and making preparations of how to try and have a peaceful interaction with the tribe and, and try and communicate. They were dropping gifts out of the plane. But Dawa was there the day it all went south. And see, the American missionaries... They landed on a little sandbar called Palm Beach. And again, they'd been working so hard and just praying that God would be leading them to bring Christ to this tribe, the Wadani tribe. However, the warriors of the tribe had only had violent in interactions with outsiders up to this point. There had not been one single interaction with a white person that hadn't ended violently. And so there was some fear going on in this equation. And Dawa was there the day because the warriors approached when these men had were finally ready on the ground outside of the plane. The warriors approached them, spears out, and killed all five of them. And then they unceremoniously dumped their bodies into the river. And then they destroyed the plane. And Dawa was there, and she recounted it because she was hiding in the underbrush. Her husband, she was a teenager at the time, but her husband was one of the men who m murdered the missionaries. Her husband was there, and she's hiding in the underbrush, and she, sh she took in the whole scene. Now, if you've grown up in Christian circles, you might be familiar of the story of Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and Pete Fleming and the other missionaries. The story had been told and retold for generations in a lot of churches. But here's the thing. The widows of these men went back in and continued to reach out to the tribe and they actually gained healthy relationship and they actually started living among the tribe and they actually started reaching them with the gospel Sounds insane, right? To go back into the same people who had murdered your husbands. Now fast forward 30 years. Dawa is now an adult. It's 1986 and Olive Fleming, one of the wives of the murdered missionary men, is there. And, and Olive Fleming is telling the story that it had been a long time and she wanted to again hear the details of that day and Dawa was there as an eyewitness and she could sense through the translator that Olive Fleming was very interested in the stories. And so Dawa decided to tell her version of the story, right? While she wasn't throwing the spears, she was hiding. She did witness the events. And so Dawa starts recounting the story. Tells about the spears, tells about breaking up the plane. But then she also very casually just happened to mention, and right up above the tree line, is where we heard the Kowadi, their word for foreigners, singing. And Olive Fleming was like, wait, 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 pump the brakes, back it up. You heard the foreigners singing. What do you mean you heard the foreigners singing? And you start to get the chills as you think about what was happening. She doubled down, Dawa doubled down. She said, yeah, it was right above the tree line. We heard the foreigners singing, and they were shining bright like the jungle beetles, similar to fireflies, but without the flashing lights. She said they were brighter than over a thousand flashlights. And you start to get a picture of what was going on. God's angels on that beach in the canopy of the jungle singing like a choir as these men met their death. 
a beautiful tribute from God and his messengers. Now, as the tribe began to slowly accept the widows, there was a time when a record player was brought into the camp. And, and there would be a record of choir music. And at first they said the choir music would always generate fear because the men who had done the killing would hear the choir music and they would as associate it back to that day. They would be in terror because they knew something supernatural was happening. And so the record's playing this choir music. And meanwhile, these hunters are freaking out because they associate it with fear. But as the Yuan Galeon, as the message of the gospel of Christ began to reach them and they began to accept Christ, that fear of that choir sound was generally replaced with joy. That's exactly what's still going on in our lives. We know we can't stand in God's presence by ourselves, but because we are reconciled through Christ's death on the cross, we know we're restored to perfect relationship. We know that fear that we once had of God on the scene has now been replaced with joy because we are his. So where does that leave us, Foundry? What do we need to ask before we leave this place? I think it still comes down to this. Surrender is no small ask, right? If I say, hey, will you think about re-embracing the miraculous with eyes to see and ears to hear, but also surrendering, that's a big ask. I get that. And maybe it seems too good, too miraculous to be true that God himself would step in. But I know this, I don't want another Advent season where it's just about Mary and Joseph and the baby and the wise men and the camels and the cookies and the presents and the gifts. I don't want to miss the miraculous again in our midst. And so maybe this is the Christmas foundry where we ask ourselves if we really believe that God is present. Because like I said, I don't want it to be just relegated to something of the past. I believe God is here. I believe he still wants to show up in your life and in my life. I think there's so much he would long to show us if we would have those eyes to see and those ears to hear. Maybe this is the Christmas where we start to embrace the mystery of the supernatural. Did you ever hear about Thomas Jefferson's Bible? He cut out, talk about a product of your Western education. He cut out every example of the miraculous from the pages of his Bible. Just gutted it, right? Imagine the Christmas story with no miracles in it. There's not much left. But my hope and my prayer is for Foundry that this would be the Christmas again, that we embrace the miraculous, that we know there is no fear in this God who calls, calls us back to himself. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know my heart and my tendency is to, to doubt when you're showing up is to be skeptical of, of how you're moving in the spiritual realms. But Father, help me not to dichotomize. Help this church not to dichotomize the spiritual and the material. Help us to be people that know through faith we can embrace both the material world and the spiritual. Give us the eyes to see. Give us the ears to hear. May we be, as you said, Jesus, people who are blessed because we're trying our best to hear and to see what you are doing behind the veil. Give us that peace that we don't need to fear surrendering our lives to you anymore. That when the angel says, fear not, that we'd be the first in line to say, okay, I might not get it, but I'm going to trust, I'm going to listen, I'm going to respond to that invitation that still beckons us to you. May this be that Christmas season. Heavenly Father, will you wake us up to what you have for us as a church. In your son's name we pray, amen. I'm not sure, Foundry, how you came in here today. I know we all come in from different perspectives, bringing different burdens, carrying different heavy loads with us. But I pray that you will really believe that there is good news in the fear, that there is good news in the doubt, that you will believe that there is a God, regardless of whether you believe in him or not, that wants to see the miraculous happen again in your lives. That whole idea of fear, it's just throughout all of scripture as people encountered God. But John doubles down even more so in 1 John 4. And this is what I want to take you to take with you. 1 John 4, 13. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not 
be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels fear. That's my blessing as you go, Foundry Church. This perfect love drives it out, it expels it, it banishes it. There is nothing left to be afraid of because he has bridged that gap. So you can go in that peace. Are you afraid? Of the Almighty, are you afraid? Are you skeptical? Are you doubting? Still go in peace. Go in that good news, that perfect love drives it all out. That's the type of God we serve. As you go, uh, we forgot one part of the service, and that's the greeting, the introvert's worst favorite part. So as you exit this place, Foundry Church, as you go in that perfect love, would you also greet someone here? If you have a story of the supernatural, something that has God's fingerprints all over it, Share it this week. We'd love to hear it. We'd love to know how you've seen God show up in your life. But go and have a great week in that perfect love that drives out fear. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.